More than a quarter of Premiership footballers today are black, earning fortunes and being adored by fans. But when the game began, it was almost exclusively white. That is, until one black Briton had the determination, guts and skill to cross the white line. Almost 100 years ago, he was one of the first black professional players, and he was playing at the very highest level. You would think that alone would be enough to guarantee him a place in history. But not only was he a footballing hero, he also became an officer in the British Army, an army that referred to black people as woolly-headed niggers in official correspondence. But he still fought and died for this country, his country. His name was Walter Daniel Tull. Despite an upbringing that was scarred by tragedy, he grew up to be a leader of men and became the first black officer in the British Army. He fought on the Western Front at Passchendaele and the Somme. After leading his men on a daring mission, he was nominated for a military cross, which he never received. He's a British war hero, but if you look at the history books, his name is conspicuously absent. For some reason, his achievements have long been ignored. He's the first black person to be commissioned in the British Army. Surely there should be something, and he should be somebody that everybody has heard of. They didn't want men of colour to join, full stop. What was it they were afraid of? Black officers commanding white men. Every year, we pay our respects to all those who have fallen in battle but some soldiers are more unknown than others. When I was growing up in Birmingham in the 1970s, I loved stories of British heroes of yesteryear. But as I got older, I realized there weren't any British heroes who looked like me. When I was at school, British history seemed to be entirely white. And as a black kid growing up, the only images that I knew of black British history were slavery and the Windrush migration. Then about 10 years ago, I read about a football match being organized by my local MP, Bernie Grant a memorial match in honor of Walter Tull. And I thought to myself, Walter who? And when I looked into Walter Tull, I found a boy's own hero. He ran out at football grounds across England, ignored the abuse and fought for every ball. And as if that wasn't enough, he then became an officer in the British Army, where he led his white men on missions across enemy lines. He was exactly the black British hero I'd never had as a kid. I became obsessed with Walter Tull. His story both inspired and angered me. And now, 90 years after his death, we can finally put together the pieces of Walter's life and rediscover a true black British hero. So, I'm going on a journey in search of this forgotten hero. It's a journey that will take me from the East End of London, where Walter was brought up as an orphan, to the football grounds where he felt the full force of society's racism. And following in Walter's footsteps, I'll travel to the battlefields of France, where he fought so heroically. And I'll be asking the question, why, to this day, has Walter's bravery gone unrecognized? But my journey begins here in the archives. In digging around in old match reports of the time, I found the first mentions of his name. In 1909, the newspapers reported that Spurs had signed an exciting young forward called Walter Tull in a move they called the catch of the season. And it's by looking in the newspapers that I can begin to get an understanding of the era that shaped Walter. 
At the beginning of the 1900s, Queen Victoria's reign had just come to an end, and Britain had a vast global empire. It was also the era when football was leaving behind its public school origins and becoming a huge spectator sport for the working classes. And the big clubs like Newcastle, Aston Villa and Tottenham Hotspur were always eager to attract new talent. These tattered old pictures show Walter making his home debut in front of 32,000 fans at White Hart Lane. The match report in the Chronicle stated, Tull is very good indeed. Walter was young, handsome, smart, and on his way to becoming a star player at Spurs. He had the world at his very talented feet. For a signing on fee of 10 pounds, Spurs now had one of Britain's first black professional footballers on their books. You'd think that it would be a proud part of the club's history, but the truth is very different. So I'm going to meet a former Spurs star who for many years thought he was the club's first black player. And it was only by chance that Garth Crooks found out about Walter. So Garth, how did you first come across Walter Tull? Well, I first came across Walter Tull by accident, actually. Um, I was at White Hot Lane, we'd finished training, and I found myself in the O crew, adjacent to the boardroom. And in those days, in the early 80s, they had pictures, you know, pictures going from the 60s right through to the 1900s. And I would, I found myself looking at these pictures and, you know, 61, 62, the famous double winning side, and you go through that and you, and I found myself looking at a picture that dated back to 1909. And see a young black lad, very handsome looking lad, in a typical team photo, legs crossed, arms folded, hair parted in the middle, I thought, who the hell is he? Because at that time, I thought I was one of the very few black players who played uh, for the Tottenham first team. And um, I looked along the list of names, and I looked, it was a W Toll. Playing for Tottenham Hotspur was very special. It was a big club, it had a great history, you were a part of that. So he was playing right at the very height of football. Spoke to the Tottenham historian. He'd, he'd never heard of him. And thought, this is incredible. Why don't, why have I not heard about this lad? But finding out about Walter is difficult. When I looked in Spurs' official history, I could find no mention of his name. It seemed as if football had chosen to forget him, and I wanted to know why. So I've come to meet Phil Vasili, the football historian who rediscovered Walter in 1993 and is writing his biography. First of all, how did you discover the story? It was by chance, really, because uh, I was researching the history of black footballers in Britain, and uh, as you do, you get your head down into books and you just look through biographies, uh, annuals, encyclopedias and things, and um, came across uh, in a, an encyclopedia by Maurice Goldsworthy, written in the 60s, I think, and it had just a couple of lines, really, about D. Tull, not, not W. D. Tull, um, Tottenham Hotspur, and thinking, well, how come this guy played for Spurs, such a big club, and he, he hadn't been remembered? The more I found out about his life, every tiny piece of information, every scrap of detail captivated me, really, and I thought, how come he's been forgotten, this guy? Was it a rarity to see black players on the pitch in the Edwardian period? There were other black footballers around, but they, they were few and far between. The first black professional in England dates back to the 1880s, when gentleman goalkeeper Arthur Wharton played for Preston North End. But Walter was playing when the game was exploding as a spectator sport. Obviously, Spurs were a big club at the time, and in terms of status and the quality of football that he was playing, and and the quality of footballers he was playing with that first year at Tottenham was, uh, was just uh, another world for him. With huge crowds watching his every move, Walter was one of the most high-profile black men in Edwardian Britain. The fans nicknamed him Darkie Tull. 
and I want to know if this was typical of the kind of attitudes he would have been up against. So I put it to Dr. Hakim Adi, who has studied the black presence in Britain. How were black people perceived by the general population? Racism was part of British society, and it's something which, if you like, ref reflected what was going on in the world. Britain was a major colonial power. It had an empire. And the aim was to uphold, if you like, the, the hierarchy which existed in that empire. White was on top, uh, black was at the bottom. So these ideas were around and they filtered down to ordinary people in the street, through the church, through missionaries, through musical, through popular books and comics and so on and so forth. We, we have to remember that racism wasn't illegal in Britain until 1965. Racism was entirely legal. Uh, it was only a, a moral or an ethical question. It wasn't a legal question. Walter's story forces us to face some of the prejudices of the past. And amongst the match reports, results and statistics, I've uncovered evidence of the racist abuse that Walter faced. On the 2nd of October, 1909, Tottenham Hotspur came here to Bristol City and Walter played in a game that almost finished his Spurs career. It was here that a section of the crowd of 20,000 consistently jeered and abused the black player. The reporter from the Football Star witnessed the crowd's relentless hostility towards Walter and was outraged by their behaviour. Candidly, Tull has much to contend with on account of his colour. His tactics were absolutely beyond reproach, but he became the butt of ignorant partisan. A section of the spectators made a cowardly attack upon him in language lower than Billingsgate. They were quite ruthless in their targeting of Tull with racist comments and abuse. From the kickoff, it was a rough game. And to the fury of the home crowd, Walter gave as good as he got. There was this black man going around the field knocking over their white players, and they didn't like it, you know, so uh, he got a stick for it. They just gave him uh, a lot of abuse. These days, clubs like Bristol City are fully signed up to initiatives like kick racism out of football. But in the early days of the game, the players and the crowds were rough and ready. So I asked football historian David Goldblatt to describe how the crowds would have reacted when Walter ran out onto the pitch on that fateful Saturday afternoon. Would it be fair to assume that many people watching Walter Toll play would have never seen a black face before? No. Well, football is white. Football is white. You know, you've got a cauldron-like atmosphere. Crowds could be roused to pitch invasion, stone throwing, you know, as well as kind of pretty full-on cussing of one kind or another. I mean, what's separating you and the pitch is hardly anything in most places. You've got people crowded together. Yeah, I mean, people are looking for weakness in the opposition. People are looking for something to pick on. People are looking for a way of getting under the opposition's skin. Bristol's got a serious slaving heritage. We know Bristol, you know, to a great extent, its finery and its wealth and its pomp is built on stolen lives and stolen labour. And therefore, you know, you've got a very particular attitude, I would think, uh, a mixture of, you know, guilt and derision, I suspect, um, in attitudes towards black people in Bristol. You know, it's had much more intimate contact with, let's face it, the business end of uh, violent imperialism. Um, that said, we know about the Bristol incident because somebody wrote it down. I mean, I find it hard to believe that Bristol would have been the only place that he was likely to receive that kind of, um, that kind of response. You could, you know, you've gone to Liverpool, you've gone to Manchester, you know, I could imagine just the same thing happening to him. Walter's experiences at Bristol City were one of the first reported instances of racism in football. But it's a problem that's persisted